Hi Bobcats, in this video we're going to take a look at how we define Gibbs free energy. Uh, it gives us a, a simpler tool to use for predicting if a reaction is spontaneous or not. Rather than looking at the entropy change of the universe, um, we can look at the Gibbs free energy change just of the system that we're interested in. So we don't have to calculate delta S for the whole universe, we can just focus on our system. And so we'll look at several implications of this in this video. Okay, so we are going to look at the second and third law of thermodynamics. Uh, we're going to um, look at delta S for the universe, for the system and the surroundings, uh, define Gibbs free energy, look at signs, and see, uh, start to see some of the ways that we can calculate delta G for a process. Whew, a lot of objectives for one section. All right, well, let's take a look at the laws of thermodynamics. Um, I, personally, I'm most interested in if you know the ideas of these laws of thermodynamics. Um, but unfortunately, lots of people who write tests like to write questions like, what is the first law of thermodynamics? What is the second law? So just make sure you know the number that goes with each one of these ideas. Uh, the first law of thermodynamics is conservation of energy. We don't create or destroy energy. The second law of thermodynamics says that in any spontaneous process, there's always an increase in the entropy of the universe. So we actually already looked at this one. We just didn't call it the second law of thermodynamics. Um, another way that this law is often stated is that the entropy of the universe is increasing. Right? Because spontaneous processes happen all by themselves, and if, um, if, if in a spontaneous process there's an increase in the entropy of, uni of the universe, that means that the entropy of the universe is constantly increasing. Um, if you are a physics major, my apologies in advance. Um, I have made physics majors in the past very upset with this statement, but I think it just has a little bit, um, it, it's just a difference in perspective, not a difference in content. Um, so just remember when you're in your chemistry class, this is how we talk about um, the second law of thermodynamics. You may look at things a little bit differently when you're in a physics class. And for the third law of thermodynamics, um, the entropy of a pure crystalline substance at absolute zero is zero. This is just basically defining the zero point of our entropy scale. The uh, perfect crystal at zero Kelvin has zero entropy. All right, let's take a quick look at the second law of thermodynamics. Um, it tells us that the entropy or the delta S of the universe has to be positive for a spontaneous process. But let's break down the universe, right? Normally in thermodynamics, we talk about the system and the surroundings. So the system is the thing that we are interested in. The surroundings is everything else in the universe. So if we add the system plus the surroundings, we get the whole enchilada. And the second law tells us that for spontaneous reactions, delta S of the universe is positive. Well, how do we calculate delta S of the universe? That seems like quite a daunting task. Um, there's got to be something simpler, something that allows us to focus just on our system and not be concerned about the entire universe for um, calculating or for, pre for predicting if a, if a process is spontaneous or not. All right, so this question of predicting spontaneity with being able to look just at our system, well, we can answer that question with Gibbs free energy. By definition, Gibbs free energy, or the delta in Gibbs free energy is delta H minus T delta S. G is the Gibbs free energy. And here's the kicker. A process is spontaneous if delta G for that process is less than zero. So we can calculate delta G for just our system. And if we get a negative number, it's a spontaneous process. We don't have to be worried about the entire universe. So saying that delta G of our system is negative is equivalent to saying that delta G of the, I'm sorry, delta S of the universe is positive. 
right? Those are equivalent statements. They are both saying that the, that the process will be spontaneous. And one way of thinking about Gibbs free energy is it's the portion of the energy change of a reaction that's available to us to do useful work. And, um, and just keep in mind that delta G of the system being negative is equivalent to saying that delta S of the universe is positive. Both of those give us criteria for saying that a reaction is spontaneous. Okay, so sometimes we'll be asked to predict if something is spontaneous based on numerical values for delta H and delta S. Sometimes we'll just be given the signs of delta H and delta S and asked to predict if it's a spontaneous process or not. So um, let's take a look at our equation and see if we can kind of reason our way through this. Um, our equation tells us that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Now let's look at the four possible cases for the signs of delta H and delta S and see what that's going to tell us about delta G. So first of all, let's start off um, on the first row of this table with delta H being negative. So that means that our first term here in the equation is a negative number. And then let's let delta S be positive. Well, if delta S is positive, then this quantity minus T delta S becomes negative. Delta H was negative. So a negative combining with another negative definitely gives us a negative value here for delta G. So if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, the reaction will be spontaneous regardless of what the temperature is. Now, let's say that we keep delta G, I'm sorry, delta H being negative, but now let's flip the sign on delta S and make delta S negative as well. Well, if delta S is negative, minus T delta S becomes a positive number. So we have a negative delta H um, that we're adding to a positive um, minus T delta S term. So if T is zero, Delta G will just be equal to delta H and will be negative. But as T gets bigger than zero, that second term gets more and more positive until eventually it, it wipes out the negative value of delta H. And delta H minus T delta S becomes a positive number. So in the case where delta H is negative, and delta S is negative as well, the reaction will be spontaneous for low temperatures, but as T gets bigger, it's gonna flip, delta G will flip over to being positive, um, so it's only spontaneous for low temperatures. Now let's look at another case. Let's look at delta H being positive, and so it, it, if delta H is positive, when the temperature is zero, the reaction is not spontaneous because delta G is equal to delta H, when the temperature is zero. So um, if delta S is positive, minus T delta S becomes negative. So as T grows and gets bigger than zero, eventually that minus T delta S term will overwhelm our positive delta H and it'll flip the sign of delta G to be negative. And so for um, high temperatures, the reaction will become spontaneous. Now, in the case of delta H being positive and delta S being negative, um, no matter what temperature it is, this is delta G is going to be a positive number. And so in that scenario, um, delta G is positive for all temperatures and the reaction is non-spontaneous um, at all temperatures. Now, if you like math, and you followed that reasoning that I just did, you don't need to memorize this table because you can look at the questions on the test and go, okay, well, let's see, delta H is negative and delta S is positive, so here's how it's all gonna play out. But if um, what I just spent the rest of the, the, the previous four minutes talking about um, didn't make any sense to you, you probably should memorize this table. Um, based on the sign of delta H and the sign of delta S, what will the sign of delta G be?
For this question, we're asked, in which case must the reaction be spontaneous at all temperatures? Uh, delta H is positive. Well, let's, let's keep our equation in mind. Um, our equation tells us delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And let's start out with the scenario that um, the temperature is equal to zero, because if T is equal to zero, then delta G is simply equal to delta H. So if, if it's um, not spontaneous at T equals zero, then we know that's not going to be our right answer. So the first, um, the first scenario is that delta H is positive and delta S is positive. Well, if delta H is positive, then at temperature of zero, delta G is positive as well. So that would not be spontaneous because delta G has to be negative to be spontaneous. If we have a scenario B, delta H is equal to zero, and um, delta S is negative, um, that will not be spontaneous because at a temperature equal to zero, then delta G would be zero and it would be neither spontaneous nor non-spontaneous. Um, if we have delta S is equal to uh, zero and delta H is positive, well then at temperature equal to zero, it's not spontaneous. And let's see, delta H is negative. Um, well, let's see, delta G is equal to delta H at a temperature of zero, so that would make delta G negative. And then if delta S is positive, minus T delta S is negative, and we have a negative delta H, so that would combine to give us a negative delta G at all temperatures. And so um, it looks like answer D would be our correct answer. In this example, we're trying to find the temperature range over which this reaction will be spontaneous. Well, that flip between spontaneous and non-spontaneous um, will happen at whatever temperature makes delta G equal to zero. And so um, our equation is delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And so what we're gonna do here is assume that uh, delta G is equal to zero to give us that temperature at which the reaction flips between being spontaneous and non-spontaneous. So I'll put zero in for delta G. That's going to be equal to delta H minus T delta S. Um, let's see, I'm going to add T delta S to both sides and that's going to give me T delta S is equal to delta H. And then finally to get T all by itself, I'll divide both sides by delta S. And so we'll have delta H over delta S. And we can plug in some numbers here. Delta H was negative 249 kilojoules. And oh, look, I've got a unit conflict. I've got kilojoules on uh, delta H and joules on delta S. So I'm just going to convert kilojoules to joules. Let's just go ahead and do that. We'll add three zeros at the end of our kilojoules. And then in our denominator for delta S, we're going to have, oh, whoops, and that's joules. In our denominator for delta S, we'll have negative 278 and that'll be joules per Kelvin. So we have one of our Kelvins in the bottom. That'll flip up to be just plain old Kelvins. The joules will cancel out. And so now I've got a negative 249,000 divided by a negative 278. And that gives me a temperature of 896 Kelvins. And so now the question is, is it spontaneous at, uh, above this temperature or below? Um, let's take a look at what happens at T equals zero, because at T equals zero, delta G is equal to delta H, and that gives us a, a negative value. So delta G is negative at T is equal to zero. So um, this reaction should be spontaneous for temperatures less than um, the uh, 896 Kelvin we found. So spontaneous below 896 Kelvin.